All right, so we're going to get started here. So thank you for joining us for our webinar tonight, Vascular Laser Treatments with New 650 Microsecond Technology, presented by David J. Goldberg, MD, JD. Dr. Goldberg is recognized for his innovative work with skin lasers, cosmetic dermatology, and non-invasive facial and body rejuvenation techniques. A board-certified dermatologist who has been in practice since 1985, he has treated patients and taught doctors throughout the world in the use of these cutting-edge technologies, including Aerolase Lipod lasers. Under his direction, Skin Laser and Surgery Specialist of New York and New Jersey has been a pioneer in making skin laser and cosmetic dermatology technologies available to the public. He has been an Aerolase laser owner since 2011. So at the end of the presentation, we're going to have a Q&A session. Um, and so during the presentation, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to type them in, and we will try to get to, to as many as possible. Um, and so now, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Dr. Goldberg. Hi, everybody. Um, so the, the idea of treating vascular lesions uh, with vascular lasers, of course, is not new. Uh, I've been in practice for 31 years. Uh, one of the very first lasers I, I obtained almost 30 years ago was the pulse dye laser. And we've gone through multiple eras of pulse dye lasers and IPLs and KTP lasers, uh, and actually uh, quite a few 1064 nanometer NDX lasers as well. What's novel about the system is not so much its wavelength, but it's everything else about it. And it starts with the 650 microsecond technology. It is a microsecond NDAG laser, unlike all of the other millisecond NDAG lasers. And the strength of that will come out as I go through this talk. And so we're going to talk about a vascular laser overview. That's our first part of our agenda. And then I'll focus in on the advantages of the 650 microsecond uh, NDAG laser, 1064 nanometers, and then look at the new expanded range of vascular applications and other applications uh, that can be used with this very unique, small, very portable system. So as I alluded to, the traditional vascular laser modalities are the pulse light laser, which first came out in the mid-1980s at 585 nanometers, and then ultimately became today's 595, typical pulse light laser that people know about. Uh, it's not that this laser doesn't work, uh, but it is inherently unstable because it is a dye system. The dye must be replaced. Uh, depending on the brand you have, there are cryogen issues, uh, a lot of issues with this laser. But to its credit, it was the first of the effective vascular lasers going back to the mid-'80s. Uh, that was followed by KTP lasers, which were less likely uh, to give the uh, black and blue, the purple that we saw with the pulse dye laser at 532 nanometers. Uh, but because of that shorter wavelength, and the lower the number, the shorter the wavelength, the less penetration of depth we were able to achieve. And so 5A5595, the pulse dye laser, actually went deeper than the 532 nanometer KTP laser. And then ultimately, the 1064 nanometer lasers, the long pulse NDAG lasers, came on the market. And notice 1064 is a much higher number than 585, 595, and 532. So the NDAG lasers penetrated much deeper into the skin. Yet these were all millisecond NDAG lasers. And again, I'll get to the differences between that and the current 650 microsecond NDAG laser from Aerolase. No matter what the laser, the ideal characteristics of a vascular laser are its affinity for hemoglobin. Obviously, we're treating things that are red, and the red part that's absorbing the laser, that is the chromophore, is hemoglobin. We ideally want deep penetration uh, to get to the vasculature. That is, we have to get through the epidermis and then well into the dermis, the second layer, to get to these blood vessels. And then you do need high power to break down the vessel wall, because what we're trying to do, of course, is destroy these vessel walls without destroying the skin around them. So if you look at this graph, you can see the KTP laser and the pulse dye laser both pretty well absorbed by hemoglobin, but not penetrating very deeply. And the NDAG laser also absorbed by hemoglobin, a strong affinity for hemoglobin, but equally as important going much more deeply into the skin than do either the KTP or pulse dye lasers. And here you can see it again, look at KTP, the yellow bar on the left, uh, going fairly superficially, barely getting into the dermis, followed by the pulse dye laser. Uh, two other lasers that tend to be used more for hair removal but have a little bit of hemoglobin absorption, the alexandrite and the diode lasers. And then ultimately the 1064 nanometer NDAG laser with its deepest penetration well into the dermis, affecting some deeper vessels. 
So solid state NDAG lasers, high power systems uh, can achieve very high fluences, and that's a good thing they have. And we can get very high fluences with the Aerolay system, this uh, uh, LiPod Neo system. Uh, NDAG laser, 1064 nanometers, meets all the criteria that I just mentioned. You want affinity for hemoglobin. Well, 1064 nanometers certainly has that. Ideally, you want deep penetration to reach vasculature, and 1064 nanometer has that. And then you want high power to break down vessel walls, and that can be easily accomplished with a 1064 nanometer NDAG laser. The limitations, though, of the historically used and, and frankly still used vascular modalities are the pulse light laser at 595, and again, started at 585, but now pretty much all of them out there are 595. Certainly effective, but has less depth of penetration uh, than does 1064 nanometer uh, NDAG laser, and is associated with discomfort, swelling, and as much as we've, as much as we've tried to cut back on purpura, still often see purpura for this to work well. KTP lasers, 532 nanometers, are only are only best used for small vessels. And that makes sense because most of the systems out there have pretty low power and limited penetration depth. And contrast that to the historical millisecond, again millisecond, longer pulse duration than the Aerolay system, 1064 nanometer. That's partly absorbed by water and melanin and is associated because of that absorption by water and melanin and the longer pulse duration with certainly more discomfort as there's next to nothing with the Aerolay system. Uh, and certainly if this is used uh, inappropriately around the nose, you see scarring with those long pulse, older 1064 nanometer NDAG lasers. So that gets us to the unique 650 microsecond 1064 nanometer technology from Aerolace. So we talked about the fact that we ideally want to have high fluences. Well, we can get high fluences from this, somewhere in the range of 255 or so joules per centimeter squared. Yet it can be done, in contrast to the older NDAG lasers, it can be done with a shorter pulse duration. That's 650 microsecond. So that's 0.65 milliseconds, less than one millisecond. That gives us rapid heating of the target, and it avoids collateral thermal damage. And that's why we tended to see some scars from the older, longer pulsed NDAG lasers. And what the system in its uniqueness does is it leverages the power, the depth of penetration, and the hemoglobin affinity of 1064 nanometers, but it avoids the collateral tissue damage of the longer pulsed, older, three to 30 millisecond domain 1064 nanometer NDAG lasers. Uh, there's been a fair amount of publication about this laser. Uh, uh, some of it is obviously mine. Uh, there was a paper that we published in uh, Dermatologic Surgery uh, with Amy Rose. She was a NYU dermatology resident at the time that looked at the successful treatment of facial telangiectasias using this micropulse 1064 nanometer NDAG laser. Uh, and uh, eventually a book came out um, by Carger. Carger is a Swiss publisher uh, with another fellow of mine, one of my procedural dermatology fellows, Susan Bard that looked at the whole gamut of vascular treatment of uh, laser treatment of vascular lesions with a fair amount uh, on Aerolase technology as well. This book is actually still in print. So the study that was published in, in dermatologic surgery, uh, we looked at 20 subjects um, aged 35 to 70. Uh, and, you know, as is generally the case with facial telangiectasias, they were somewhat light complected, uh, Fitzpatrick skin types one, two, three. Uh, they received the one treatment a month for two months, so two treatments overall. And the laser is the one I mentioned. It's the Aerolay system, 650 microsecond NDAG laser. Uh, and the parameters were a two millimeter spot size, 191 joules per centimeter squared, was the fluence and one pass per vessel. So we went over the vessel one time, we saw constriction right away, and that was our endpoint. Uh, evaluation of results was based on clinical assessment of digital photographs, as is often the case, as well as both patient and investigator assessment in the reduction in size and appearance. So those are two factors, smaller in size and then perceived appearance based on a five-point scale. The results of this study, as I said, published in Dermatologic Surgery, it's uh, now uh, a little bit over three years ago already, uh, patients experienced significant and even dramatic improvement in the appearance of facial vessels. They reported minimal discomfort, uh, and we saw virtually no complications or adverse events. And that's in contrast to uh, years of experience that I've had using the longer pulse millisecond NDAG lasers, which can get rid of vessels, but particularly when used around the nose, you'll see ice pick type scarring. They're just, just too strong. This gentle system, the airlay system, does not do that. 
So it's a very broad system in terms of what it can do. There's a uniquely broad vascular range of red targets, all of which have hemoglobin, using the 650 microsecond 1064 nanometer technology. Uh, the whole gamut, the rosacea, which obviously is very common and it's an ongoing issue. Uh, Pycloderma, the, the, you know, the sun damage that we see on people's necks with both vasculature and pigmented lesion components. Facial telangiectasias, some of the smaller leg vessels, uh, little cherry angiomas, uh, venous lakes on the lip. This this is an ideal treatment for venous lakes uh, on the lip, both upper and lower lip. Uh, we've had unique success with this laser in acne, um, and that's thought to be th through not so much the effect on hemoglobin, but thermocoagulation of the sebaceous glands, a, a primary cause of flaring of acne. Uh, I, there's been some good success with psoriasis. Uh, there was a very nice paper presented uh, just this past weekend at the South Beach Symposium uh, in Miami on the use of this laser for psoriasis. A whole variety of erythematous scars can be improved. And then, you know, we see bruising, all of us, and no matter how good you think you are, we've all had bruising following fillers, or for that matter, botulinum toxin, uh, and this laser is just terrific at getting rid of the black and blue from that as well. So here's some examples. So this is a physician from uh, Moscow. Uh, you can see the rosacea here, the improvement. This is after a couple of treatments. Uh, this is the uh, same doctor from, uh, from, from Russia. You see the improvement after two treatments, Natalia Goroskova. Uh, Michael Gold, National Tennessee. Again, tremendous improvement um, in, in her rosacea, her sun damage. Uh, look at her neck as well. She has poikiloderma and the improvement there after two treatments. Uh, this is one of our patients published in dermatologic surgery, uh, and you can see, particularly look at the nose, the uh, matte telangiectasia on the nose. Uh, this is after a second treatment, and you know, in all, in all fairness, there's still something left even after two treatments, but you have to compare that to the kinds of results we see with an IPL, the intense pulse lights, where it often takes uh, four or five treatments to get to this point, uh, and yet very safe and uh, you know, a sense of, of warmth, and there's certainly not pain while this is done. Edward Zimmerman, uh, some facial telangiectasia is just an absolutely terrific result. And I think the message you're getting here is most people uh, get two treatments. Uh, occasionally we get lucky, it's only one treatment. Occasionally we're unlucky and we go to three, but typically it is two treatments. As I mentioned, this can be used on small spider veins on the legs. Um, we sometimes use sclerotherapy for the bigger vessels, but this laser is just absolutely terrific for the smaller vessels. Here you can see the results here. Cherry angioma is incredibly common. Uh, you see more of them with age. They definitely run in family. People come in, they want to know what all these little red things are. They get them on their chest, their back, sometimes their scalp. Uh, this is Khalil Khatri on Boston, uh, dermatologist up there, uh, and often one treatment. So, And of course, these could be treated with a hypercater with cautery, but the difference is you treat them with cautery and you do enough of them, you're going to get some scarring. And you can see the absolutely beautiful cosmetic result after one treatment with the Aralase. 650 microsecond, 1064 nanometer NDA laser. This is uh, impressive stuff. So, you know, this is a hemangioma, and, and in order to improve those, you have to have depth of penetration. You're never going to get that depth with a uh, pulse eye laser, with a KTP laser, but uh, you can see this was done over, over the course of eight sessions over a year, but just a terrific result for a childhood hemangioma on the foot there. Uh, Venus Lakes, um, you can see here on that lower lip, go on after one treatment. Venus Lakes are, are kind of like cherry angiomas. They just respond very quickly, very easily. Just a couple little zaps and uh, you can pretty much kiss those goodbye. And I mentioned acne. Um, it's a very unique system and, and it's really worked quite well. Now, this is Michael Gold's patient. This is a terrific result. Not every patient gets this good a result, but you know, the fact remains you can see the tremendous improvement. You know, it took a while, it took six treatments, uh, 13 months after that six treatment. Uh, cystic acne tremendously improved. And these are people that typically are going to have to take a chronic course of antibiotics. Uh, they may have to take uh, uh, oral retinoids. And, you know, I don't look at the lasers being a cure-all. Nothing cures acne, uh, nothing at all. Uh, you know, eventually acne just goes away. So you're trying to treat this uh, without uh, with, and trying to improve the acne as well as lessen the scarring. Uh, and it's nice to be able to do this without taking oral agents. Again, Kilokatri from Boston, another acne patient, three treatments. Uh, because of the 1064 nanometer wavelength, uh, it's so poorly absorbed by melanin, 
pigment, uh, you can use this laser very successfully and very um, uh, easily uh, without complications in darker skin types. So this is a Fitzpatrick 6 dark skin type individual uh, with acne treated with the ARLA system, and you can see the results after one treatment. And typically we'll go through a few treatments and stop for a while and see where we are and sometimes go back to it, but it works very well. This is our patient. Um, this is uh, she had monthly treatments for five months, uh, at the, and I can I can only vouch for my patients. Uh, I obviously don't know all the details of the other patients, but uh, I'll show you this and, and perhaps another acne patient. These people, the only thing they used while they were being treated uh, were, were some topical antibiotics, nothing systemically, no retinoids, and no other procedures. Uh, and this girl had been on on antibiotics for for years before we got to her, uh, and this is after five treatments, three months later, and, and you can see the absolutely terrific result. Uh, another acne patient, not ours, you can see after six treatments. And so if you look at telangiectasias as needing, oh, generally two or three treatments and perhaps uh, uh, cherry angiomas and venous lakes, one treatment, uh, obviously acne is a different process. This ha does have to be treated more times, uh, but incredibly safe treatment, uh, you know, near painless, uh, no complications at all. Uh, and this is the psoriasis that I mentioned. Um, this is just a very dramatic result. And it makes sense. I mean, you know, if we go back 25 years ago, uh, the pulse dye laser was used to treat psoriasis because if you look at the histology of psoriasis, uh, and you look at this under the microscope, there are a lot of dilated blood vessels. So what is the laser doing? It's sealing off those vessels and that improves the psoriasis. Here's a scar, um, and you can see the improvement there. Uh, this is, uh, again, 650 microsecond, Aerolase 1064 nanometer technology That's after one treatment. I find I typically have to treat most of these people two or three times, but you can see the improvement here after one treatment. Uh, stretch marks, another scar, uh, great result. Um, you know, the key is to get the erythema early, uh, and then you lessen how much whitening occurs later on by getting rid of the inflammation. So the earlier we treat the stretch marks uh, with this laser, the better the results. And I mentioned black and blue. This is uh, someone that Michael Gold injected with a filler. Uh, it could happen to anybody. I'm sure it's happened to probably everybody on this call. It certainly happened to me. Uh, the, the irony of treating this is that uh, if you treat these people right after they get the black and blue, the lasers tend not to work no matter what you do. So we bring them back a day or two later and you treat them uh, one treatment with this laser and you can see the great results. So in the end, the benefits of the 650 microsecond 1064 nanometer technology, uh, high power, great depth of penetration, uh, it's uniquely gentle treatment, uh, and it avoids purpura. Uh, and I don't know how many people on this call have felt it. Uh, it's a sensation of warmth. Uh, it's, it's rare that people say it's painful. If 10 is god-awful and 1 means it doesn't hurt at all, most people describe this as a 3. Uh, it's versatile. It covers a broad range of conditions. Uh, we went through the gamut. It's everything from telangiectasias to rosacea to red scars, to venous lakes, to cherry angiomas, uh, to psoriasis, to acne. Uh, what I didn't talk about tonight is that this is a great device for creating new collagen, uh, the sort of toning of the skin. I look at it as anti-aging of the skin. Uh, there is no skin cooling or anesthetics. Uh, this is an air-cooled system, uh, so there's no cryogen cooling, there's no air blowing, there's no contact cooling, uh, and there's no skin contact by the handpiece. Um, as you can see, uh, the, the handpiece is not even placed on the skin. Okay, we're ready for some questions. I'm going to start right here with one. Um, you mentioned sclerotherapy. Do you use that in, in conjunction with the light bud laser? I do. Um, you know, the, there are people out there that will do a session of sclerotherapy and then, then a, a session of, of you know, light bud neo. Uh, to me, that doesn't make any sense um, because uh, I, I find I, I use them generally together. And, and the basic rules I have are if they're larger vessels on the legs or thighs, uh, I'll use square therapy. If there's smaller vessels on the legs or thighs, I'll use Neo. And then as we get toward the ankle where we don't want to ever use square therapy, um, I'll use the Neo even for the larger vessels, but uh, they do well together. And the one nice thing about treating vessels with the Neo in contrast to sclerotherapy is, uh, you know, I, I tend to use compression bandages with sclerotherapy. Um, if they have a lot of small vessels, I'll just use the Neo, and they don't need compression therapy. Uh, their life is a lot easier. All right, excellent. So we have a couple more coming in here. Um, do you use lower fluences for darker skin types? 
Um, you know, the, the, the general rule is yes, but, but remember, this laser is so darn safe in darker skin types really for two reasons. Um, one, because of the MDI wavelength, and two, because of the microsecond pulse. So although that is the basic general rule, with this particular laser, I pretty much use the same energies uh, on darker and lighter skin. What do you generally say is the clinical, clinical endpoint for either facial veins or hemangiomas? So I'm not looking for purpura, um, you know, like you would expect to see from pulse eye laser. I'm looking for some some constriction. Okay. Uh, we have one that came in who is not sure how to program their laser to use 650 microsecond pulse. I think that's to address the, uh, that's specific to aerolase. Is that pulse duration? Well, the pulse duration is set at 650 microseconds. Um, I, I'm not sure what that question is. Okay. Uh, what, what fluences are you generally really using for either uh, spider veins on the face or for the lower extremities? So I, the fluence I use um, sometimes is, is indirectly related to the size of the vessel. So I talked about on the face when we treat telangiectasias, we used 190-ish joules per centimeter squared. Um, I find sometimes when I treat larger vessels, I actually don't need to sign a fluence. Um, and so I'll go somewhere in the range of maybe anywhere from 80 to 120. Now, do you ever see any blistering either on the chin or on the face? <laughs> okay, so, you know, we didn't talk about the fact that I'm an attorney, um, and, and so I'm never going to say never about anything, and obviously everybody who does uses this laser, just like everything else you use, there should be consent form and blistering and scarring and all those things should be mentioned. Having said that, this laser is phenomenally safe, and if you simply follow the preset uh, parameters that, that they suggest you use, which frankly now I get a little bit more aggressive then, but if you follow them, uh, you are very unlikely to get blistering. Okay. How close to the eye would you would you treat an angioma or a, a sweater vein? Well, if, I, if, if I'm even thinking of the question of how close to the eye can I get, when that crosses my mind, then I'll use a laser eye shield. And so, it, you know, if, if your question is how close can I get, as soon as that comes up, put in a laser eye shield. Uh, because remember, there's spread of these lasers below the skin. Um, and so, you know, I, I pretty much I'll go up to the orbital rim. Uh, without putting a light, an eye shield, but as you get closer, um, you know, obviously you've got to use eye protection anyway, whether it's gauze pads or suntan goggles. Uh, but as I get the things right along the lash line, uh, you really have to be very careful with that. And I put laser eye shields in with a little bit of topical anesthetic and some lubricant. Okay. And with that, and in, the, in the same area, uh, what about uh, under eye bags or circles? So under eye bags and circles, um, you know, if there's some pigment there, uh, this laser will help. Uh, if there's some fine lines, this laser will help because you create collagen. Uh, if they have herniated fat pads, um, no, this will not help because nothing does outside of surgery. Okay. And in terms of the color of the vessel, can it also treat bluish greenish vessels, uh, purple vessels? And so, you know, when I think of purple vessels, uh, Venus Lake is purple. Uh, some of those smaller vessels on the legs are purple. So uh, purple versus red is not an exclusion. Uh, they both work. All right, I also have a couple more come in here. Um, with acne, how, how does acne compare to uh, P PDT or photodynamic therapy? So photodynamic therapy, for those who don't know, is the use of a topical photosensitizing agent known as ALA. Uh, and then you activate it with a whole variety of lasers and light sources. I mean, almost everything we talked about tonight works. Uh, PDT actually works quite well for acne. Um, you know, there's never been a study to compare uh, Lipod Neo, Neo uh, the airlay system, to PDT. So I, I can't tell you which works better, but I will tell you that PDT is a mess. And so, you know, we've used PDT on some college kids, and, you know, they're not careful about how much sun exposure they get, and they look like they've been frying on a barbecue. Uh, you use the airlay system, and it's just gentle and mild, and there's no wound and that's never an issue. So um, yeah, I think they're very different approaches. Okay. All right, we have a question from one of our dermatologists in the Bahamas, and she's asking for the best settings for generalized erythema of rosacea and how many treatments uh, you space them out. 
Right. So again, I, the skin color is is not really an issue with this laser because of the uh, the wavelength, 1064 wavelength, 650 microsecond pulse. You know, as I said in our study, you know, which is really telangiectasia and rosacea, you know, we used 190 joules per centimeter squared. You know, if you want to start, maybe 150-ish. Uh, but but the point is, you don't you don't really have to distinguish um, between uh, light and dark skin. Now, having said that, in darker skin, and I'm you know, talking in the Caribbean here, uh, you know, you're not going to see as many of these facial vessels as you do in in, in lighter skin. Okay, and what about uh, sebaceous hyperplasia? So sebaceous hyperplasia, to me, is somewhat akin to the approach we use to treat acne. You know, what are you trying to do in acne? You're trying to thermocoagulate sebaceous glands. And sebaceous hyperplasia essentially are overgrowths of, you know, sebaceous material. Uh, so I look at it the same way, and, uh, yeah, you never cure that problem, but, but it's so easy to treat them with, with this uh, 650 microsecond NDX laser. Okay, and, and with that, uh, what is your clinical endpoint? With, the with sebaceous hyperplasia, I'm looking actually just for a shrinkage. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't treat enough that it's gone. I treat enough so that it looks like it's about half the size of when I started. Okay. Um, let me see. So we have a general protocol for acne uh, that we recommend. Uh, do you do anything special with yours? Well, I, I, you know, the, the, there is the protocol that the earliest recommends. Um, I, I actually don't treat people as often as that protocol. Uh, I've had people come in anywhere from two to four weeks. Uh, most people do this once a week. Uh, I think you, you have to base that on your patient population, and I find in the New York metro area, uh, there's just no way these people are coming in every week, and, and we've done it every two to four weeks, and frankly, they've done fine. If you were to open a laser center today, uh, would you start with a LiPod laser or an IPL? So I think if I was asked that question five years ago, which I often was, I always told people to start with an IPL. Because what I liked about IPLs in those days were uh, you could treat so many things with it. Um, five years later, there is no question in my mind, if I were opening you know, a med spa, an office, first time, or I was already established but I wanted to open a second office, uh, I would definitely start with this NEO system. Because look at all the things you can do. It is small. You can stick it in your back seat. You can move it anywhere. It doesn't require cooling. It doesn't break down. Uh, and so this is, to me, this system is the ideal starter system, and it's the ideal system if you are already set up and you want another laser to do lots of things. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we touched a little bit on this earlier with, with PDT. Um, you know, how, how does the LiPod compare with red and blue light treatments? Yeah, so so red and blue treatments. So if you talk about red and blue um, by itself, I mean, there's no question red and blue does impact on acne, and now there's some home devices uh, that also are used. Uh, but you, you're never going to be able to compare those to a high-powered laser like this. I mean, this is always going to do better. Uh, that's different than PDT, which is using perhaps red and blue light activating the ALA, uh, and, and that may work about the same as the, as the NEO system, but uh, for anybody on this phone who's ever used PDT, you know what it looks like. It's a mess. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, we get this question a lot in terms of uh, using retinoids or other topicals um, w with the NEO for acne treatment. Yeah, you know, the interesting about retinoids is uh, that forever there was this dogma uh, that retinoids are activated by either light or ultraviolet exposure. That recently has been shown to be bunk. Uh, and having said that, I've had patients on retinoids all the time uh, who have acne and where I've used this laser, and that has never, ever, ever, ever been an issue. Okay, a couple more treatment questions. Um, you know, we saw one picture on a infantile hemangioma um, with some really good clearance. Uh, can you treat that on other parts of the body? Safely? Well, you can. And you can. Now, having said that, I actually have no experience treating hemangiomas. That was a, a doctor from Moscow. But, but there's no reason you couldn't use. I mean, if you're using it for hemangioma on the foot, you could just as well use it for hemangioma on the face, you know, the extremities, and the trunk. Okay. We have one question about hydrogenitis uh, protiva. Yep. I like the way you the way you got that one out. That's that, that was close. Hydradenitis super, superativa. Yeah, I appreciate but, it. Yeah, that, that was good. Um, all right, so you know, hydradenitis, as as people know, is, is it's a very difficult problem to treat. It's essentially tracking cysts that occur, most commonly arm, armpits, sometimes in the groin. Um, if you start treating this condition before it gets a lot of scarring, um, it tends to respond pretty well to uh, really all the different devices for hair removal. And, and we didn't talk about this system for hair removal. And there's certain things we didn't talk about tonight because the focus was on vascular. But this is a 1060. 
before nanometer laser that works quite well for hair removal. Um, and therefore, if you treat early hydratinitis with this system, it will work. Do you see uh, an immediate clearance when treating facial, vasal, uh, facial veins or rosacea? No, um, and that's true for all vascular lasers. Um, and I tell patients not to expect results right away. You, you know, they, they may get some initial constriction, but that, that's not a long, that tells them what things are gonna be like in the long run, but that initial constriction then disappears, the vessel reappears, but it tends to start settling down two to four weeks later. Okay, uh, a couple more that I'm seeing in the chat window here. Would you ever use this on a subungual uh, hematoma? A sub hematoma. I guess that's not much different than a black and blue mark. Um, you know, the, the issue is that the laser is not likely to go through the actual nail, so you'd have to get it from the end. Uh, I haven't done it, but there's no reason it shouldn't work. Okay. And in terms of uh, using the laser, uh, do you delegate it all, or do you primarily use the device? <laughs> Depends where you are. Um, I don't know where that question came from. Depends which jurisdiction they're in. So, right. you know, there are some pretty strong rules in the state of New Jersey where I practice, and the state of New York, laser hair rule is not even considered the practice of medicine, so high school kids can do it. So, uh, you know, that's really going to depend on the state in which you practice. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, all right. Let's see. Uh, have you ever treated a sinus tract with this? I have never treated the sinus tract with this, and, and I doubt it would actually work, because the only way you could treat a sinus tract and get it to close down is to really scar it the heck out of it, which is exactly what this laser doesn't do. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of treatment questions come in here. Uh, we have this, uh, does it work for SKs and AKs? Um, I would not use this on a tin keratosis. Those are precancerous changes, and this is not the appropriate approach for that. Um, it could work on seborrheic keratosis. I mean, it, it would work through heat, but you know, there are a lot of easy ways to treat seborrheic keratosis. So you could use this laser just like you could use it on some warts, uh, but please don't use it on a tin keratosis. Here, you're talking about a pre-malignancy, and uh, that's one good way of getting yourself in trouble. Not that okay. it's going to do anything wrong; it just won't get rid of them. Yeah, very good point. Um, all right, so we, we touched on a couple other devices, KTP and PDL. Um, one, one question is the effectiveness uh, between the NEO and a 940, uh, which I believe is a diode. Well, that's, yeah, it's an older system. So uh, the 940 diode was, sort of was a takeoff on, on some of the uh, older 532 systems. Um, you, you can't compare. So 940 doesn't go as deeply as 1064, so NEO wins on that. The 940 systems um, all had uh, millisecond pulses, not microsecond, um, and so this is safer. And then lastly, the 940 systems, and whoever asked the question may have one, uh, certainly doesn't get the fluences that you get from the, from the NEO. So. All right. And since we are on a vascular topic, um, in terms of contraindications, if a patient has lupus, can you use the laser on them? So, you know, that, that's uh, been asked, like, for, for about 20 years. The whole idea about treating people with collagen vascular diseases, whether it's lupus or scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, all of these things. Um, and, and, you know, of course, these people are people that get telangic agents, um, and, and we treat them all the time. So, you know, you're not there, – there's some concern that visible light – um, or ultraviolet light may exacerbate, uh, you know, some things like, like some forms of lupus, like discoid lupus, but not this wavelength. Um, and so we, we treat people with, uh, you know, it's usually either, either lupus or scleroderma. They get a lot of telangiectasias on their face. We treat them all the time. We touched on, uh, on this a little bit, um, you know, the versatility of the laser. What else can this laser do? Um, you could use this laser to improve melasma, and it actually does a pretty good job at that. Uh, you know, there's no cure for melasma. It's kind of like, kind of like treating acne, but uh, the issue with melasma is you, you need a wavelength that is going to, on the one hand, lessen pigment, which this can, and on the other hand, not create too much inflammation, which this does not. And so it works pretty well for melasma. Uh, you know, it's probably not the ideal way to treat uh, what are called age spots. It might help them some, um, but, but melasma it actually does a pretty good job. All right, and uh, I'm going to call this the last question here. We have a question about the protocol for psoriasis. So that's a good question. So um, I, I keep going back to the, the settings that we started with for telangiectasia, 190 ish joules per centimeter squared, and I talked a little bit about size of vessels, so bigger vessels need lesser fluences. 
if you look at the histology of psoriasis, they have pretty big vessels in their dermis. And so you, you don't even have to use the, the parameters that we use for facial vessels. Uh, somewhere 60, 90 joules per centimeter squared uh, works just fine because psoriasis plaque or patch is just loaded with vessels. Okay, I think that about wraps it up for tonight. So I would like to thank everyone for joining us tonight and also thank you, Dr. Goldberg, for your expertise and your excellent Q&A session. Have a great night, everybody. Uh, thank you.